So yes, I am Antoinette Burton. I'm the chair of the Department of History, and I just wanted to say a few welcoming words um, to all of our, our guests from out of town um, to the conference and say a little bit about the genealogy of the uh, symposium. So 10 years ago, I was a brand new faculty member at Illinois, and one of my senior colleagues effectively said to me, you're new, organize something for Women's History Month. <laughs> so I approached some history graduate students and said, I think we could do a conference at which we, you could present your work, and I'm willing to help you begin to organize it, but it's your project, so you, you have to run with it. We started that year with three papers by um, History at Illinois graduate students delivered from a modest podium in Gregory Hall. That there were faculty and students bursting out of the room, eager to see and hear what this new idea for a graduate symposium on women's and gender history might be like, seems prophetic now. That year after year, graduate students take time from their own work and teaching to create this confection is an awesome thing, something we faculty privately marvel at on a regular basis. Over the years, the symposium has grown from local to regional to national to international in terms of its reputation and its capacity to gather aspiring scholars of women's and gender history and studies in Urbana-Champaign every March. As we all know from reading our critical theory, and of course living in the current moment, globalization is not necessarily a good thing, but in this case, the accelerating diversity of topics, methods, and people which make up this wonderful intellectual event every year is unquestionably an excellent thing for the whole campus community, not least because it showcases the amazing work in the field and renews our hope that students who present here are destined for great things in the academy and in the world. I have the fortunate task of thanking all the organizers without whom none of us would be here, poised to listen to one of the most important theorists uh, in the academy today. I want to begin by thanking all the members of the symposium's executive committee, Stephanie Sewell and Chris Lindicum, the finance co-chairs, David Greenstein and Laura Doros, the programming committee co-chairs. Could you guys stand up? So Stephanie and Chris, David and Laura, stand up, 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 up. Myra Washington and Andy Eisen, organizing committee co-chairs, where are they? Up, 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 up. <laughs> Derek Attig, communications chair. There he is. <laughs> Heidi Dodson, proceedings chair. <laughs> Anna Karajic, futures chair. Special recognition, I think, is due to the programming committee co-chairs, David and Laura, who've organized not just this weekend's program, but who have worked tirelessly and with amazing insight to leave their intellectual imprint on the feast that you have before you. Last, but certainly not least, is Nathan Cayo. Nathan, stand up. This year's symposium, this year's symposium coordinator. <laughs> I say this every year, and I mean it differently every year, um, with... with particular reference to the individuals who take on this amazing task. As anyone who's put on an event like this knows, it takes a rare and remarkable, co remarkable combination of smarts, patience, and determination to pull it off. As many of us also know, making feminist projects come alive in the spectacular way that this one has is above all, above all a labor of love, for which, Nathan, we are all greatly in your debt. Okay, now, um, one more click. Um, Leslie Regan, who is um, a professor in the history department, among many other things, and she's going to announce the Gender and History Prize. Leslie. Hello. Uh, so yes, I'm in the history department and other places. Um, but I'm wearing the hat for Gender and History. I'm on the editorial board, and it is my great pleasure to be able to announce the winner of the uh, Best Essay Prize from Gender and History. And the winner is Betty Luther Hillman, who is a candidate for the PhD at Yale. And for her paper, The Clothes I Wear Help Me to Know My Own Power, The Politics of Gender Presentation in Feminist Activism, 1966 to 1978. As I understand it, she was not able actually to get here tonight. Um, but if you 
uh, congratulate her when you see her and um, when you hear her paper. Uh, the gender and history editors were quite impressed with the papers as a whole, but in particular her paper, which argues that gender presentation was a crucial and contested issue in the broader feminist movement of the 1960s and 1970s. And she reads letters to feminist magazines and oral histories to really think about uh, this idea that there was a consensus of what gender looked like, and actually she finds there was no agreement actually about what a man looked like or what a woman looked like or what a lesbian looked like or a straight person and, and, and she has a very interesting mix of people by class and gender and everything else. So we have to go. Um, gender and History hopes she will publish uh, her, her paper with them and also hopes that all of you will similarly uh, revise your papers and submit them. And I will also say, as always, <laughs> as part of the Journal of Women's History, which is housed here, that journal of, the Journal of Women's History hopes for the same thing. And these are two you know, superb journals who are in competition, but also in collaboration, because they're supporting this conference um, throughout the entire weekend. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Siobhan Somerville. <laughs> Uh, who's a professor in the English Department and Gender and Women's Studies. And of course, and what else? Oh, I thought you were telling me something else. <laughs> You're just saying stop. <laughs> Well-known scholar um, and author of Queering the Color Line. And that's all she's going to let me say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Um, before I introduce um, our keynote speaker tonight, I, I also want to congratulate the students who have put this um, incredible conference together. It's just really amazing, and I look forward to um, as much of it as I can, can come to, and I especially want to thank Nathan for all of the work behind the scenes that, that you've done and for inviting me to participate. It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Roderick Ferguson, who is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of American Studies at the University of Minnesota. Professor Ferguson is perhaps best known for his original and path-breaking book, Aberrations in Black, Toward a Queer of Color Critique, which was published in 2004 by the University of Minnesota Press, which offers um, a sweeping um, and amazing uh, movement among different disciplinary formations, including African American studies, queer studies, American studies, and not to mention the disciplines of sociology and literature. The book is an indispensable uh, history and critique of canonical sociology's production of heteronormative models of race, particularly the Chicago School of the 1930s, Models that he shows have persisted in pernicious and often invisible ways to shape not only the field of sociology, but also uh, way beyond, including state policy and social movements. Since the publication of Aberrations in Black, Professor, Professor Ferguson has published numerous articles on governmentality and the ra racialization of sexual normativity, which, among other things, confirm his status as one of the most provocative and consistently productive um, scholars engaging with uh, the possibilities and limitations of Foucault's work. Um, through his ongoing elaboration of queer of color critique, Professor Ferguson has made crucial interventions into queer theory, including revising received genealogies of the field. The tendency to locate Foucault as a necessary starting point in queer theory, as Professor Ferguson has co so convincingly pointed out, has obscured the very rich body of theory and practice that had already been forged by feminist women of color. An interrogation, quote, that theorized sexuality as a constitutive component of racial and class formations. Um, I, I know I'll, I wanna keep this short, but I do wanna mention one way in which aberrations in black stands out methodologically. Um, and that is Professor Ferguson's commitment to juxtaposing canonical texts of sociology with literary works in each chapter. Though trained as a sociologist with a PhD in sociology from the University of California at San Diego and a BA in sociology from Howard University, he nevertheless gives equal weight and evidentiary power to both sociological and literary texts, something rare in cross-disciplinary scholarship. And even before publishing that book, in fact, he received the Modern Language Association's uh, Crompton Knoll Award in 2000 for best essay in lesbian, gay, 
and Queer Studies in the Modern Languages, um, which was for his article on James Baldwin, the Parvenu Baldwin, and the other side of redemption. Uh, I think he's gonna show us this side of his work again tonight, and we're uh, fortunate to hear this talk, um, which is entitled, which is from his new project and is entitled, My Man Bovan, a Black Feminist Critique of Black Power and the Institutionalization of Movement Politics. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rod Ferguson. All right, my um, sincere thanks to the Center for Advanced Study, the Miller Committee, um, all the folks behind the Symposium on Women's and Gender History, and I will follow in a distinguished line and also thank Nathan um, for his very capable handling of my arrangements. Um, I, a few years ago, after um, finishing Aberrations, decided to go on a little experiment and that experiment had to do with uh, the question of how do we write a history of the student movements and the rise of the interdisciplines, the ethnic studies, the women's studies, the queer studies, the disability studies, the post-colonial studies, um, as a history of power. And this uh, presentation tonight is from a chapter uh, that tries to do that with the rise of African-American studies. <clears throat> and using Tony K. Pombara's My Man Beauvain. Now this tale is about why the affirmation of minority culture won't necessarily lead to the estrangement of power. The tale is Tony K. Pombara's My Man Beauvain, a story that tries to narrate the contradictions of black power right when black power was taking hold. My Man Beauvain fictionalizes another story, one about the means by which the contradictions of a national liberation movement worked its way into corners, streets, and neighborhoods, written from the standpoint of the old, the disabled, the no account, the apolitical, and the inappropriate. My Man Beauvain narrates and theorizes how power begins to speak through and as minority nationalism during the moments of radical student activism. It tells the story of how a certain discourse of minority difference is generalized beyond the academy shaping relations outside, inaugurating a new grammar of minority culture and identity, one in which that discourse becomes the alibi for dividing the world into two intelligences, those who were conscious about cultural difference and its significance, and those who were not. Indeed, revolutionary nationalism helped to produce and promote social hierarchies despite its claims to vanquish inequalities of race and class. And all this came from a little short story about some mess that was started because two old folks were doing a little bump and grind. <laughs> My man Beauvain must be situated in the national and global changes of the civil rights and post-civil rights movement. Moment, excuse me. In the US context, Western man suffered his greatest upset because of the race and gender-based movements of the 60s and 70s. In addition, the San Francisco student strike of 1968 to 1969 forced the establishment of the Division of Ethnic Studies and full-fledged departments of Black, Asian, Chicano, and Native American studies. Black studies, as Manning Marable notes, went from being, quote, a discourse and body of scholarly work confined largely to racially segregated institutions and came out of the Cold War context into a vibrant curriculum with hundreds of programs fighting to change white higher education, end quote. The national and international context for this change of character was laid in prior decades in the transformation of the global status of black and third world people in the United States and internationally, a move that occasioned the rise of the United Nations and the convening of the 1956 Congress of Negro Workers and Artists in Paris. In addition, the Cold War competition between the US and the Soviet Union also promoted an interest in black culture and history as the Soviet Union pointed to the racial hypocrisies of the US in an effort to discredit the U.S.'s promotion of itself as an exceptional democracy. 
the intellectual context for the institutional emergence of African American studies and the alienation of Western man was also centered through the rise of academic organizations devoted to the study and promotion of black life and African heritage. In sum, minorities of all sorts would go from being members of empty-handed generations to people headstrong with histories and civilizations. The historical moment that saluted my man Beauvain was one defined by an interest in black culture and consciousness. The short story was first published in 1971 in the periodical Black World under the title Mama Hazel Takes to Her Bed, and then later under the current title in Bambara's anthology, Gorilla My Love. The short story's publication within Black World reveals yet another facet of that historical juncture. To begin with, Black World was part of Johnson Publication, the people responsible for Ebony and Jet magazines. In many ways, Johnson's interest in basing a publication on black power aesthetics and principles reveal much about capital's own interest in rather than its retreat from minority culture and the US student movements. More pointedly, the publishing world's interest in the student movements and in the black arts movement testified to the fact that black culture was not simply of interest to anti-establishment radicals, but to the establishment as well. Indeed, it was a moment in which the establishment would learn to affirm the most radical enunciations of difference. This was a period in which what happened in the academy and on campus yards would impact the world outside. The circumstances of the short story's publication thus testify to the far-reaching impact of academic matters upon presumably non-academic institutions. In this context, minorities in general and African Americans in particular were gaining rights and representations that would usher in new forms of independence as well as a new love object that would disseminate stories of group solidarity, identity, and origin. Now, that love object would go by many names, but the one that the short story uses is grassroots. If we are to believe my man Beauvain, though, the arrival of this new object did not usher in a season of unbridled liberation, but provided the building blocks for a new way to regulate. In the following section, the main character, Miss Hazel, introduces the reader to Beauvain and simultaneously illustrates the function of that category. She states, nice man, which is not why they invited him, grassroots, you see. Me and Sister Taylor and the woman who does heads at Mamie's and the man from the barbershop, we all there on account of we grassroots. And I ain't never been souther than Brooklyn Battery and no more country than the window box on my fire, on my fire escape. And just yesterday, my kids telling me to take them countrified rags off my head and be cool. And now, can't get black enough to suit them." End quote. Miss Hazel introduces the category grassroots as one that presumably bestows a new admiration and respect onto everyday black people. Grassroots is the category that expresses appreciation for working class and poor blacks, the category that can rebut the historic construction of African Americans as a degenerate and dispensable population. Grassroots would correct this dismissal and pre present blacks as fundamental elements to political organizing and community building. The label would represent a chance at the A-list for Miss Hazel, Beauvain, and people like them because grassroots identified them as political and social facets of that object of love known as minority culture. Despite the historic exclusions and dismissals that grassroots is meant to correct, Ms. Hazel is keenly aware of the ways in which the category misnames her and the other older folks from the neighborhood. In fact, she approaches the concept as a kind of partition between the time before the category's debut and the moments produced after its arrival. For her, it signifies a shift between yesterday and now. Yesterday marked the moment in which Ms. Hazel's countrified rags and the other elements of vernacular culture were not part of the democratic reign of appearance and flattery. But today, they and theirs are part of a radical and liberated moment in which they become the object of the young militant's dictation. 
The further we get into the short story, the clearer it becomes that national liberation is not the heroic solution to inequality, but a looming problem for the very constituency that national liberation was supposed to shelter. While many a radical presumed that power would be alienated by cultural and revolutionary nationalism's deployments of minority difference and culture, power would find ways to subdue by affirming nationalism's analyses. One of the ways in which power did that was through what the French theorist Jacques Rancière calls stultification, or, quote, the presupposition of a radical break between two forms of intelligence, one form represented by the master who hands out knowledge, and the other symbolized by the student who sits and receives. We can see stultification at work in the following scene from the short story. Miss Hazel says, so everybody passing saying, my man Beauvain, big deal, keep stepping, and don't even stop a minute to get the man a drink or one of them cute sandwiches or tell him what's going on. And him standing there with a smile ready, in case someone do speak, he want to be ready. So that's how come I pull him on the dance floor. And we dance, squeezing past the tables and chairs and all them coats and people standing around up in each other's face talking about this and that, but got no use for this blind man who mostly fixed skates and scooters for all these folks when they was just kids. So I'm pressed up close and we touch talking with the hum and here come my daughter cutting her eye at me like she do when she tell me about my apolitical self, like I got hoof and mouth disease and there ain't no hope at all. In this scene, Beauvain's incapacity is figured in his blindness. Miss Hazel's is symbolized through her lack of social and sexual decorum. In this context, the category apolitical arises as the designation of an incapacity. But it is a designation that could only come out of the circumstances of left progressivism. Circumstances that would make oppositional consciousness the basis upon which to presuppose the unconsciousness and imbecility of the grassroots. So when Miss Hazel is dancing with Beauvain, her kids take that as the glaring sign and egregious wonder of her apolitical nature and thus attempt to make Miss Hazel aware of her incompetence for radical endeav endeavors. This construction of Miss Hazel and Beauvain as apolitical and therefore backwards, and the children as the custodians of revolutionary politics, is precisely what Ranciere means by stultification. Through practices of stultification, power would make the most of those hierarchies of knowledge approved by the movements themselves. Elaborating the concept, Ranciere argues that stultification is, quote, the first knowledge that the master transmits to the student, the knowledge that he has to be explained to in order to understand, the knowledge that he cannot understand on his own. It is the knowledge of his incapacity. In that way, progressive education is the endless verification of its starting point, inequality, end quote. The student is the silent and ungifted muse who inspires the teacher's representation. Likewise, in my man Beauvain, the folks from the grassroots represent gods and goddesses known less for their powers and more for their functions in the schemes of people half their age. This radical break that constitutes relations between the militants and the old defines the political economy of the party itself, one in which the budding revolutionaries impart to the seniors a knowledge of their incapacity. Miss Hazel tried to tell them, though. She tried to name the distance that constituted this stultification. For instance, when her children malign Mr. Beauvain, calling him a Tom and referring to his eyes as blown out fuses, she responded by asking, is this what they call a generation gap? Generation gap, spits Ello, her daughter, like I suggested castor oil and fricassee possum in the milkshakes or something. That's a white concept for a white phenomenon. There's no generation gap between black people. We are yeah, well, never mind, says Jolie. The point is, Mama, well, it's pride. You embarrass yourself and us, too, dancing like that. Here, Ello stultifies the relation between parent and child, fashioning her mother as the ignorant student bereft of radical consciousness and constructing herself as the master endowed with Afrocentric knowledge, using the metaphoric relation of master and student to explain stultification, Ranciere says, quote, 
The master's secret is to know how to recognize the distance between the taught material and the person being instructed. The distance also between learning and understanding, end quote. In her indignation over her mother's presumably ignorant reference to the notion of a generation gap, Ello not only calls attention to an alleged distance between a black cultural knowledge and Miss Hazel, she calls attention to that distance by first disavowing it. She disavows it because Miss Hazel and the others comprise the grassroots of black politics. As such, they are presumably the evidence of an uninterrupted relationship between young and old. But Ello's statement is also a rebuttal to an old woman in need of explanation and correction. By associating her mother's question with white folks, she identifies her mother's own intelligence with an inferior Western logic, making Miss Hazel culturally inauthentic and intellectually deficient. While her mother, Beauvain, and the rest of the ordinary folks in the abstract represent the unbroken pace of tradition and history, they are, to the children, just as much the broken down inheritors of a grave miseducation. The historical record presents the pedagogical and stultifying relationship of master and student, not so much through a story of generational conflict, but through the narrative of national liberation sexism. For instance, in 1970, Bambara's The Black Woman, an anthology addressed the ways in which patriarchy within African American communities and black radical organizations accounted for relations of stultification between black men and women. Eight years later, Michelle Wallace's Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman would grapple with the sexism of black radicalism during the 60s and 70s. In the classic text, When and Where I Enter, The Impact of Black Women on Race and Sex in America, historian Paula Giddings discusses the patriarchal affirmations of the period. She writes, quote, both black men and radical chic white men, women too, applauded the machismo of leather jacketed young men armed to the teeth rising out of the urban ghetto. The theme of the late 60s was black power punctuated by a knotted fist. It sought a common ethos between northern and southern blacks, although it may not have been consciously conceived out of the need to affirm manhood, it became a metaphor for the male consciousness of the era." End quote. Indeed, we can say that black feminism during that period represented a critique of a particular, albeit hegemonic, genre of black male affirmation, one that was predicated on slotting black women into the position of students who, in the words of Angela Davis, were supposed to, quote, inspire their men and educate their men's children, end quote. Because of the ways in which the short story analyzes the power formations that position the neighborhood folks as the students who inspire the teacherly young radicals, we can therefore locate my man Beauvain within black feminism's critique of black nationalist stultification. The short story is unique, though, because it not only names gender as an element of stultification, but age and disability as well. Indeed, the short story is concerned with how Miss Hazel and Mr. Beauvain are regulated because of age, how Miss Hazel is disciplined according to gender and sexual propriety, and Beauvain is othered because of disability. By attending to Stultification's intricate network, my man Beauvain suggests that nationalism's economy of Stultification was never populated with one hierarchy, but with many. Hence, we can read my man Bo Beauvain as a literary text whose aim was to clarify how black nationalist historiography as a social discourse was lubricating an economy of stultification that would distribute mastery and tutelage as the basis of a wide array of subject and social formations within black communities. In the context of the short story, it is the young people, the self-appointed guardians of culture and community who Miss Hazel has to fight off. The relations of force that the short story dramatizes are produced by the well-intentioned and the militant. They allegorize contentions between radicals and their constituencies, quarrels safely removed from the historical archive, frictions kept on the quiet tip. To hear the progressives tell it, they are inequalities that can be obscured or even overlooked because they are the necessary practices of liberation, the appropriate conventions piled on the people we love.
Now you have to remember that in the days of student movements and liberation, good intentions made their way on breezes. Stuart Hall recalls those times and says, I think I can hear what people were saying at that moment. Jamaica for Jamaicans, a new Jamaica, the Caribbean coming together. There was a belief in the beyond of colonialism, and that's a utopia. That's what people were looking forward to. And of course, they were confident about it because those movements had been growing in different ways around the world for a long period of time. And everybody knew their, mo their moment had come. The post-war moment was going to be the moment a lot of those movements had been lying low during the war after gaining a lot of momentum during the 30s. But as soon as the war was over, everybody knew decolonization was going to happen. So of course, that's a moment of huge confidence, end quote. This was the emotional tenor of a decolonizing time, one that inspired faith in the nation form. According to this faith, the nation could be liberated from the violations of liberal democracy and Western imperialism and put to radical ends. But the malignancies of colonialism, which work their way into post-colonial nations, undermine that confidence. Hall states, quote, the moment of decolonization was a moment when the deformations of colonialism had not been deeply interrupted. There'd been a shift of political power and domination, but take the Caribbean, it remained a poor, one crop, economically dependent region, end quote. Hall describes here the realities of neocolonialism, the fact that the dismantling of the colonizers' ensigns might ordain a new hegemony. This shift, in Hall's words, would, quote, show why Fanon was right. You have to have your nationalist moment, but the nationalist moment can never be enough. It can never be enough. And Fanon has wonderful passages on what happens then, the attempt to build a unity for developing the nation leads to the emergence of single figures or one-party states, no contradictions, no place in the ideology for opposition, end quote. Hall indicates here that as the nation form became the goal and endpoint of liberation, the autocracies of the colonial era would take hold of anti-colonialism's epic experiment. We can think of My Man Beauvain as a record and critique of that era's enthusiasm for institutional transformations. Ms. Hazel, for instance, cr critiques the young rad radicals' presupposition that they will endow the folk with unprecedented agencies and usher in nation time. Her agnosticism is roused because the young people's radicalism evokes prior institutional histories and formations ones that were presumably put down by black nationalism. Still discussing her children's response to her flirtations with Beauvain, she says, and here come my youngest task with a tap on my elbow like you the third grade monitor and I'm cutting up on the line to assembly. During this exchange, her daughter Ello compares Miss Hazel to a bitch in heat and Miss Hazel thinks to herself, Terrible thing when your own children talk to you like that, pulling me out the party and hustling me into some stranger's kitchen in the back of a bar, just like the damn police. Both of these instances are significant for the ways in which they call to mind prior institutional entanglements. Task, tap, and the children's ambush reminds Miss Hazel of grammar school regulations and police encounters, clashes that are presumably the antitheses of a revolutionary movement. But Ms. Hazel's memories of school and police harassment point to the ways in which black nationalism operates as a palimpsest inscribed with the images of various institutions. Rather than being innocent of the institutional restrictions and exclusions that it sought to overcome, revolutionary nationalism often reproduced those restrictions and exclusions within its own day-to-day -day practices. Like its anti-colonial counterpart, Black power proved to be very often a weak interruption of power. My man Beauvain demands an analysis then of the ways in which institutions roam across political and cultural practices. The short story observes how the rise of black studies and black power helped to disseminate various institutional logics and practices to the presumably non-institutional landscapes of African-American communities. Indeed, the short story seems to say 
quote, there is no institutional environment that will guarantee our radical innocence. In contrast to national liberation's acceptance of Western institutional models, 60s and 70s black feminism deliberated upon the ways in which institutional logics and practices insinuated themselves into African-American communities. In Bambara's own anthology, The Black Woman, published in 1970, for instance, one contributor after another addresses the ways in which black power revivifies Western institutional concepts and practices. More specifically, the volume is filled with contributors who discuss the ways in which the patriarchal practices of black nationalism recall and promote the gender and sexual regulations of bourgeois institutions. The short story and the larger context of black feminism in the late 60s and 70s point to the ways in which hegemonic institutional formations and practices were inscribed on black nationalism. Another way of saying this is to say that my man Beauvain allegorizes the critical and interpretive function of black feminism. The short story does so by using the character Miss Hazel to present black feminism as an analytical enterprise designed to make sense of and provide alternatives to institutional logics and practices. So then, it used to be that black feminism was a way of framing and interpreting institutional overlaps and promiscuities. In this aspect, black feminism shares kinship with Derrida's notion of deconstruction and its relation to institutional analysis. In a passage in which Derrida uses the figure of the university to discuss the interplay between institution and interpretation, he writes, quote, an institution is not merely a few walls or some outer structures surrounding, protecting, guaranteeing, or restricting the freedom of our work. It is also, it is also and already the structure of our interpretation. If then it lays claim to any consequence, what is hastily called deconstruction is never a technical set of discursive, discursive procedures, still less a new hermeneutic method working on archives or utterances in the shelter of a given and stable institution. It is also, at, at the least, the taking of a position in the work itself toward the politico-institutional structures that constitute and regulate our practice, our competencies, and our performances." End quote. Like black feminism and like deconstruction, the short story illustrates that an institution is more than a set of walls and structures. Ms. Hazel, as one among the ignorant, bears witness to the interpretive structures that try to make the home folks into the tools of progressive regulations, regulations that call to mind the restrictions of school, police, and family. The picture that she gives us of national liberation is that of a collage made up of various disciplinary regimes. In opposition to those regimes, the short story takes a position against the restrictions of nationalism and attempts to undermine any notion that black nationalism is the appropriate representative of black communities. In doing so, the short story revises the subjects that constitute the masses and signals political institutional structures that are alternative to the ones that black nationalism mandated. After Ms. Hazel has gone through round after round of her ch children telling her what her responsibilities are to the movement, to the neighborhood, and to the people. She devises a plan to sneak my man Beauvain away. She begins to let her mind wander and run. And I'm thinking, I'll have him change the lock on my door first thing. Then I'll give the man a nice warm bath with jasmine leaves in the water and a little Epsom salt on the sponge to do his back and then a good rub down with rose water and olive oil, then a cup of lemon tea with a taste in it, and a little talcum, some of that fancy stuff niece and mother sent over last Christmas, and then a massage, a good face massage round the forehead, which is the worrying part, because you got to take care of the older folks and let them know they still needed to run the Mimeo machine and keep the spark plugs clean and fix the mailboxes for folks who might help us get the breakfast program going, and the school for the little kids, and the campaign and all. Cause old folks is the nation. That what Nisi was saying, and I mean to do my part." End quote. 
to the nationalists, Miss Hazel's bath with Epsom salt on the sponge and her rub down with rose water and olive oil will seem, like in Foucault's language, naive knowledges located down, low down on the hierarchy beneath the level of cognition or scientificity. These vernacular refreshments and titillations will seem to the kids inadequate to the task of nation building, but rather than submit to a logic of stultification that imagines local practices around sexuality as empty amusements, Miss Hazel reaches into some other archive and calls forth subjugated knowledges that refuse docility and banishment. And so she reactivates carnal knowledges from regional cultures, knowledges that defy stultifying hierarchies of superior and lower intelligences, hierarchies that are, quiet as it's kept, indispensable to national liberation. In the passage above, sexuality is not only a proxy for local knowledges, it is a principle of distillation, the foundation for separating the things that are worth our time from the things that aren't worth the trouble. Mimeo machines, rub downs, spark plugs, cups of tea, and breakfast programs, these items deserve some care and attention. But sexual regulation, of all the yokes to take upon them, why be responsible for that one? We can think of the passage as Ms. Hazel's formula for emancipation, what Ranciere defines as the process by which, quote, every common person might conceive his human dignity, take the measure of his intellectual capacity, and decide how to use it, end quote. For Ms. Hazel, sexual expression is a way of consummating the will, a method for asserting corporeal as well as intellectual and political capacities. In such an understanding of sexual agency, participating in the political campaign and supporting the school follows from seemingly apolitical gestures like face massages and sponge baths. For this old and ignorant woman, sexual agency denotes the broad program for transforming all the lowly people's works into ways of demonstrating the humanity that is in them as in everyone else. Sexuality names a refusal to think under the sign of inequalities that divide the world between those who have radical politics and consciousness from those who don't. And by this route, the people, in Ranciere's language, will quote, discover unsuspected intellectual and political powers that will put them on the road to new discoveries, end quote. And so she ends the short story with another name one different from and seemingly inferior to the name grassroots, but a name that is closer to the will and attention responsible for her and the people's emancipation. I imagine, Beauvain says, you are a very pretty woman, Miss Hazel. I surely am. I say, just like the hussy my daughter always says I was. As the short story uses Miss Hazel to sunder stultifying logics that contrive hierarchies of lower and higher intelligences, my man Beauvain uses Beauvain himself to, to disrupt the ableism of national liberation. In doing so, the short story exposes the ways in which national liberation in general and black nationalism in particular not only naturalized heteronormativity but able-bodiedness too. In the short story, we see heterosexuality's relationship to compulsory able-bodiedness precisely through the drama around Miss Hazel's sexual interest in Beauvain. We also see that the relationship that see that relationship mandated as a matter of pride. But just as the kids try to force Miss Hazel's heterosexuality in directions that conform to the party's goals, they also attempt to steer her sexual interests away from Beauvain because of his disability. For her interest in Beauvain, Ms. Hazel's children chastise her for being not too discriminating and behaving like a hussy. In fact, Ello says, his feet can smell a cracker a mile away and go into their shuffle number post haste, and them eyes, he could be a little considerate and put on some shades, mama, end quote. For Ello, 
Beauvain's disability symbolizes the antithesis of revolutionary progress and nationalist pride. Whereas the children's feet lead them to the community and the nation, Beauvain's feet and apolitical nature, symbolized by his blank eyes, run back to Mr. Charlie. And thus, the short story points to the ways in which national liberation operates as a simultaneous regime of sexuality and able-bodiedness in the process using race, pride, to manage disability and desire. We can read the character of Beauvain as a metaphor for a founding justification of racial exclusion, a justification based on the inability of minorities to engage in the practices and responsibilities of citizenship, elaborating upon the historic function of disability as a metaphor for minoritized statuses of gender and race, Disability studies historian Douglas C. Bainton argues, disability has functioned historically to justify inequality for disabled people themselves, but it has also done so, done so for women and minority groups. That is, not only has it been considered justifiable to treat disabled people unequally, but the concept of disability has been used to justify discrimination against other groups by attributing disability to them. Disability was a significant factor in three great citizenship debates of the 19th and early 20th centuries, women's suffrage, African-American freedom and civil rights, and the restriction of immigration. When categories of citizenship were questioned, challenged, and disrupted, disability was called on to clarify and define who deserved and who was deservedly excluded from citizenship." End quote. Beauvain refers both to the discrimination and paternalism suffered by disabled persons within the US as well as to disability's role in the grammar of African American citizenship. If disability justified exclusions from citizenship, then Beauvain as a disabled subject stands for that founding justification. Explaining the function of disability and the racialized exclusions of citizenship, Bainton writes, quote, Arguments for racial inequality and immigration restrictions invoke tendencies to feeble-mindedness, mental illness, deafness, blindness, and other disabilities in particular races and ethnic groups, end quote. Within a context in which disability has structured racial inequality, Beauvain is the figure of abjection that disturbs the order, identity, and system of citizenship. Beauvain is not only the symbol of an inaugural loss, he is also the metaphor for an originary denial of disability historically asserted by African American liberation movements. Beauvain symbolizes the occasion for that vigorous denial, the sign and justification that must be refuted. As an early example of how black liberation struggles invest in ability, we might only remember Frederick Douglass's claim that, quote, the true basis of rights was the capacity of individuals, end quote. In such a formulation, disability becomes not only the sign of incapacity, but also the obstacle to an appeal to rights. In the context of the short story, the young activists deny Beauvain in an effort to refute any charge that they and their people are disabled. Hence, quote, they are not disabled and therefore not the proper subjects of discrimination. While Beauvain may be an adequate justification for social and political inequality, they are not. As the short story shows, this denial does not arise from generic circumstances and formations. It is launched from that variety of rights and nation-based social formations that characterize much of grassroots politics of the time. Before national liberation, Beauvain's disability was agency. He repaired what was broken and everybody liked him. After black nationalism, Beauvain became pariah whose disability was stripped of any properties that might sustain community. Beauvain stands for a new function of able-bodiedness in communities defined more and more by black nationalism. Through him, the short story illustrates a constitutive but little acknowledged part of the turn toward revolution. To court Beauvain is to forfeit not only respectability, but also a nationalist future of self-determination and capability to give up the nation for a set of blank eyes and shuffling feet. But then again, Miss Hazel is a hussy, and that's exactly what allows her to refute Beauvain's illegibility as a disabled subject. She introduces to Beauvain with, introduces the reader to Beauvain with these words. 
My man Beauvais ain't my man, mind you. Just a nice old gent from the block that we all know because he fixes things. And the kids like him. Oh, used to for black power got hold of their minds and mess them around till they can't be civil to old folks. Her sexual interest in him is part of an alternative economy of knowledge that remembers Beauvais as the one who fixes skates and scooters, as someone who had a place in the neighborhood. Her desire for him, therefore, refutes an ableist construction of Beauvais as socially useless and puts her at odds with the children's nationalism. Ms. Hazel accesses local memory to rebut the sexual regulations imposed upon her by the kids and to reframe disability. And in doing so, she uses sexuality to make sure that stultification will not have the final say. Epsom salt, olive oil, rose water, and mimeo machines are not about retreating from institutional context because of their overwhelming com complexity. They're about calling for modes of valorization that are not wedded to management and regulation. More specifically, they call for the articulation of new projects and practices within the specific crisis that academy entails, ventures that will meet the management and hegemonic valorization of difference with alternative inflections of minority particularity and culture, ones that can name and challenge even the absorption of minority difference. The short story ends by directing us to critical practices that must take place within the crisis of institutionalization. If we follow the story's lead, we have an opportunity to construct a materialist analysis that engages the academy and its duplicitous valorization of minority difference in culture. We also have a chance to fashion a politics that wrestles with the academy's means of making difference valuable. In that effort, we might even achieve more radical versions of democracy. An imminent critique of this sort is necessary now more than ever. Such a critique acknowledges that minority difference and culture have the potential to be both sites of resolution and rupture, and are therefore the objects of dangerous negotiations. In Ethiopia, I hear, they tell a story of a cow that gave birth to a fire. Being a mother, her first instinct was to lick it, but she knew the baby, despite itself, would burn her. It occurred to her to leave it, but she could not do that either. That fire was her own. That burning thing is to the mother what minority culture is now to those of us who work with subjugated modes of difference. We are like that heifer who is trying to figure out how to handle a flame. Okay, now let's hear questions and comments. Hussy is a natural condition. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> is it a natural condition? You know, let's go with the um, argument that it is not a natural condition, but it's a condition uh, whose uh, literacy, you know, is not regarded as a literacy. You know, it's something that you know, exists as a sort of uh, vernacular practice. I mean, we, you know, I grew up in Georgia. So, you know, I always hear, you know, folks say that so-and-so is fast, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. And it seems to me that if we were to do a genealogy, right, you know, of a category like so-and-so being, which is always a woman, it was never a man being fast, but, you know, um, or a girl being fast. Um, if we do a sort of genealogy of 
you know, that cat category fast, or it's analog, you know, in something like a huzzy, um, then we might discover that there are, you know, it's not simply, you know, this sort of category of sort of one-dimensional abjection, but it actually might contain an entire history of how to use sexuality, you know, for purposes that could, you know, uplift, could revalorize, could heal. In, in other words, so that, you know, we might find if we took the time, you know, that uh, there's an entire ideological architecture there, you know, uh, an archive. Thank you so much for your talk. I uh, was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the whole book project that mm -hmm. this chapter comes from. Yeah, totally. Uh, this uh, is the second chapter. The first chapter, the entire book is um, tentatively entitled The Reorder of Things, Birth of the Interdisciplines. Um, and I got that title, of course, from, you know, it's a riff on Foucault's The Order of Things. And the relationship to that book is that, you know, one day I thought if Foucault had not written a book about the emergence of the human sciences, um, biology, linguistics, anthropology, economics, uh, philosophy, and the figure that, that, that the emergence of those disciplines occasioned, the figure of Western man, but if he had written a book about the rise of the interdisciplines, the ethnic studies, the women's studies, the queer studies, um, the disability studies, the post-colonial studies, and the rise of their constitutive figures, woman, person of color, um, queer, disabled subject, immigrant, um, and the displacement of the figure of Western man, that's a book I want to write. Um, so to that end, what I've tried to do is to, in every chapter, use a cultural text as a meditation on um, the ways in which particular interdisciplines um, reflect and refract uh, the changes in um, power because of the rise of the interdisciplines. So for instance, one of the things that the book, one of the questions that the book works with is, you know, in the, um, in the moment of the student movements and after that moment with the rise of the interdisciplines um, and the institutionalization of uh, um, minority culture, minority difference, then what we see in that moment is power not simply acting in um, repressive ways, you know, saying no to minority culture, minority but, but also acting in affirmative ways, um, saying yes to minority culture and minority difference. So we tried to produce a history of what those affirmations did to the changes in power, what would that look like? So for instance, the first chapter looks at um, uh, uh, an old essay from June Jordan uh, that she published in 1969 to reflect on um, the open admissions struggle at City College. And of course, open admissions was about anybody who wants to come to college ought to be able to come. And um, the interesting thing that that piece does is it talks about uh, a category that we're so used to hearing nowadays in the university, the category of excellence, so the category of standards, right? But it's always a category that we associate with the rise of global capital, um, you know, in the sort of 80s, 90s period, uh, 3M, you know, all the um, Qualcomm, whatever, I'm trying to think of industries that use excellence. The thing that she does, though, is to re-periodize that category's emergence in 1969 because people were using that in the open emission struggle to oppose it, to sort of say, if you let in all these black and brown kids, you're going to destroy standards, you're going to destroy excellence, blah, blah, blah. What she does is then to look at the genealogy of that category within slavery and colonialism, right? So right there we already have a sort of uh, alternative history of the contemporary university not simply in the use of excellence uh, in the 1980s, the 1990s, and its attachment to multinational corporations, um, which in the typical post-Marxist narrative, uh, you know, it, race, gender, sexuality, the student movements never get talked about. Um, and so what that chapter allowed me to do was to, or is to, um, 
you know, think about how the categories and the formation of the contemporary university, you know, is or has as its foundation, you know, and it's, as its burial ground, the histories of race. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, this chapter follows that chapter. Um, then there's a chapter on um, uh, the emergent, a latter chapter on the emergence of, you know, queer studies and looks at that emergence through um, a short story that kind of meditates on life after sexuality has been affirmed through things like domestic partnership benefits um, or you know, through a world that's now constituted by uh, the sort of selective affirmation of queer sexuality, like queer eye for the straight guy. Um, you know, so every chapter deals with um, the question of power in its affirmative mode and how it's exemplified by the histories of particular interdisciplines. So there's another chapter on, uh, or that I have yet to write, on the uh, emergence of um, the immigrant, you know, as a figure of affirmation that uses uh, Susan Choi's um, The Foreign Student and Juniper Lahiri's uh, The Namesake, you know, to um, talk about yet again how an affirmative mode of power apprehends you know, that minority difference in ways that um, end up also distorting you know, histories of colonialism um, and neocolonialism. So. Oh, did I? No, no, go ahead, please. You have the, you have the mic. Uh, I wrote it down. <laughs> Um, but first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for being here. Sure. And I was just hoping you could speak a little bit more about Miss Hazel's character, yeah. particularly how her role in kind of advancing the movement is very much a sexualized, stereotypical woman, and that so many of the lived experiences of activists during the black freedom movement directly countered that. And I'm thinking of a lot of the backlash regarding Elaine Brown's book, Taste of Power. It yeah. was just, you know, her yeah. sexual manifesto within yeah. the movement, yeah, yeah. and also Stokely Carmichael or yeah. Kwame Ture's, mm -hmm. you know, the, move, the sure. role of woman or the position of a woman in the movement is right. prone. Yeah, sure, um, sure. So yeah. kind of challenging the black feminist sure. critique no. and Miss Hazel being the protagonist totally, of this. Yeah. No, no, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, for instance, what we see there is, you know, it's not like she... Um, adheres to the dictates, the sexual dictates of, you know, if we think of the kids as the party, right? There's a part that I left out um, uh, of this talk for reasons of space where the kids actually want her to hook up with the Reverend Trent <laughs> because he can give them resources, you know? Um, and she has no interest in Reverend Trent, announces it to the student, I mean, to, the, to the, her children, um, so we can see her um, designation of Beauvain as, you know, a sort of, um, you know, as her sexual interest, as, you know, a sort of selectiveness, you know, in terms of how, you know, she is expressing, you know, her sexuality and stuff. You know, we don't want, um, I mean, I think that one of the things that, uh, you know, of course, is an anxiety, right? You know, is the sort of larger history of uh, the sexualization of uh, black women in the movement, right? Um, at the same time, you know, one doesn't want to sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, that, uh, you know, sexuality, you know, uh, becomes something off the table or the question of sexual capacity and sexual agency. Um, becomes um, something that we will not talk about. It is not revolutionary, you know, uh, or it is not feminist, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what we, I think, see in this short story is a sort of um, selective deployment, you know, of sexuality, uh, especially as she directs it towards, you know, this guy who, you know, the kids, he's not even a part of their revolutionary scheme. You know, they want her to go with Reverend Trent because he has resources as the pastor of the church, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that what we have there is, you know, yes, a critique of that sort of sexualization and the dictation of women's sexuality, right? You know, um, by the movement. At the same time, a sort of reutilization, you know, of sexuality um, in ways that contradict, 
you know, the party agenda. Thanks. There's a question over here and then that one. Oh, I, okay. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to ask you a question a little bit about the, the sort of intergenerational temporality. I mean, you underscored this idea like Miss Hazel kind of contests the idea of generation gap and, and, and posits this sort of alternative vision of intergenerational community, but it also strikes me that... Or rather, her daughter contests the idea of... Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah, no problem, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, the story does posit this at a particular moment mm -hmm. in the development, right, mm -hmm. where there is a kind of... There is a certain kind of intergenerational community in which there is a before and an after. There is an, a kind of institutional memory of the pre-revolutionary moment and the post-revolutionary moment. Um, so, like, you know, sort of in the story's allegory, like, how crucial is that moment in just sort of just after the kind of nationalist r revolution um, in terms of do things at some point, you know, you were talking about decolonization and I, you know, I, and from my own work as a, as, a, as a Caribbeanist, I think of the case of Cuba, like, mm -hmm. do we worry that there is a moment in which things may go so far down the road of the nationalist moment institutionalizing new hegemonies and new hierarchies that you don't know how to rescue the, the gains of the nationalist moment mm -hmm. from those yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. Like, does it have to happen in that just the aftermath of decolonization? What is the story telling us about that? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure how to answer it. I mean, in terms of, because, you know, I feel that, you know, um, maybe you want to stay, excuse me. I, maybe there was a question over here. Maybe you want to just stay over here. <laughs> this is kind of hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I, it, you know, it's kind of hard for me to answer the question in terms of like, um, well, because I so feel that we are living in that moment and, you know, and that it's so with us, but, you know, we haven't done all the work we need to do to figure out what this moment is and how we've inherited, you know, certain legacies of that moment, you know? Um, I mean, so that's just, you know, a sort of provisional answer to it. I think that it's hugely important in terms of the, in terms of a shift that never gets named as a shift, you know? And we know it from, for instance, the short story, right? But I also know it personally, you know, as, um, you know, uh, I remember when, my, when I left to, to go to college, my grandfather, who was a sharecropper and like, you know, the um, child of a slave, you know, would say to me, you know, still stay Roderick, right? Like still, that was his thing every time, still stay Roderick, because he had seen, you know, his children, other people's children change. You know, they were all like, and, you know, they were all, they weren't like, you know, these white identified kids. They were all like, you know, in the civil rights movement, you know, blah, 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 went to jail and everything. Um, you know, but like he said, he, he, you know, he still stay Roderick, okay? And that was his, that was our agreement that I would do my best, you know, to figure out how to do that, right? So um, I like to think that there was a way in which he was naming, you know, that sort of temporal shift and, you know, that sort of civil rights, you know, black power moment, the larger moment of integration as, you know, an event of huge ideological proportions, you know, um, that, you know, people lived with those rifts, you know, I mean, parents lived with those rifts between themselves and their children um, in ways that have not been accounted for, you know. Um, so that's just a kind of provisional answer to that. Yeah, so. Hi. Uh, Love the talk. It was Thanks. really brilliant. Um, and I guess my question is maybe related to Dara's. Mm -hmm. um, I, I liked the ways that you were thinking about the weaving together of discourses of able-bodiedness mm -hmm. and race mm -hmm. and sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, and that moment where you talk about her choosing to give up a future of this kind of able-bodied attachment to mm. the nation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about forms of reproduction because, mm -hmm. so she is not in a position to reproduce mm -hmm. um, or, or to access the resources that the movement wants mm -hmm. um, in the form of the reverend. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing useful about her um, 
in an obvious way about her <coughs> desire to, you know, have these kind of um, just forms of pleasure, basic yeah, yeah. pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's also not in a position to be literally reproductive either. Right. Um, right. 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 And so I just, it seemed like reproduction was, was a kind of implied um, thing that you, ke you kept coming back to mm -hmm. in the talk, and yeah, especially at the end with the um, story about the, the cow. <laughs> the cow. Um, but so I just wondered if you could talk more about yeah. Yeah. sort of the, about nationalism and reproduction. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And sort of what you see uh -huh. as um, that refusal to participate in, uh -huh. in reproduction uh -huh. Uh -huh. To kind of signifies. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, I mean, I think that, I mean, there, one way to answer the question would be, you know, sort of say that, you know, I don't know that she's not interested in reproduction. I mean, I mean not in the, the, the sense that, you know, of um, what well, she can't do it, you know, because she's a, an older woman, blah, 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 but interested in, so she's interested in, she is interested in kind of social reproduction, you know, um, because she ends by saying, you know, um, the old folks are needed, you know, to make sure that the, to run the Mimeo machines, blah, blah, blah. Um, that moment's important for me because it seems as if she is trying to engage in a sort of social reproduction, a critical social reproduction that uh, intersects with, but is not the same thing as the mandated social reproduction of the kids. You know, um, I mean, it's significant that you know she doesn't say to hell with it all. You know, the breakfast programs, to hell with um, um, you know whatever uh, um, the breakfast program, the school. You know, she in fact says, you know, I believe in that. Right? You know, there's some, I can distill certain things from this agenda, certain things from the list, from the menu, you know, uh, and there are other things that I'm going to leave because that does, that's not worth my time, you know. So there is a sort of, um, you know, a kind of critical discernment, you know, on her part in terms of like, you know, um, what kind of community do, community do I want to produce, you know? Um, and then answering that question might mean that I uh, selectively ally with myself with certain items on the menu without allying myself with the spirit of the menu, you know, or, or with every item on the menu. Um, you know, so I think that that's, I mean, there's something really sort of pragmatic about that that I like. <laughs> You know, um, that, you know, she gets that, look, there are certain things that are life and death matters. You know, the breakfast program, the school. There are other things that you do not have jurisdiction over, you know, you being the party. And um, I'm interested in, you know, trying to sort of think or to theorize sexuality as that, you know, that sort of critical discernment, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right. Right, and she doesn't submit to, um, she doesn't submit to a calculus of what is useful and what's not, you know? She doesn't say, uh, think that, like, there is nothing revolutionary about Rosewater and olive oil. Mm -hmm. She doesn't say that um, there is nothing, um, you know, like Epsom salt and baths and massages, that's a waste of time because that won't do anything for anybody. She actually sees that as, you know, part of the chain of agency that has the breakfast program and the school with it, you know? Like, I think that's a really, really important insight, you know, I mean, just for um, those of us who are in, you know, academic institutions, you know, because it's so easy. I mean, intellectuals are so good at dismissing things, <laughs> you know? I mean, if you think about, like, I mean, like, Pierre Bourdieu says this in one of, the, um, uh, one of his books, that, like, it's part of the constitutive habitus of the Western intellectual to dismiss things, you know? <laughs> so, you know, that you have an old woman who will say, no, 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 you know, um, in order to have uh, 
the school, the breakfast program, you know, I need the rub down. You know, that's a very significant moment, you know, like socially, ontologically, you know, like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, and, and I too very much enjoyed your uh, presentation. Thanks. In some ways, my comment is a follow-up on Siobhan's and also tied into uh, uh, Ashley Howard had to say. Um, I think too, I mean, just to echo what you said, I mean, the importance, I mean, as you were giving your paper and talking about the bath and how Ms. Hazel wanted to rub, uh, to, to give Mr. Bovain a bath, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I was just thinking about how important that was that, again, like she's trying to heal, you know, broken black bodies yeah. in terms of yeah. what black folks go through yeah. on a daily basis. Exactly, and the fact that right. she understands the importance yeah. of trying to heal and trying yeah. to, you know, give, give uh, an elderly gentlemen, you know, a feeling of self and wholeness is, in, is quite, in, mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. profound. But my question is this, and again, just thinking about, about, about that example, and also the fact that Ms. Hazel rejected or uh, did not follow through with her kids uh, hope that she would hook up with the uh, reverend. reverend Trent, yeah. And I haven't read the short story, and I'm curious to know if you talk more about this in, in the chapter, but it seems to me that Bambara is also making a critique, of course, of black ministers and that oh, yeah. and that you know implicitly you know not only yeah, yeah. perhaps is miss hazel mm -hmm. rejecting mm -hmm. uh, you know that she or the fact that she simply does not want to uh, to be mm -hmm. involved mm -hmm. with this man but it's also an implicit critique of how black male preachers oh, yeah. as you know one of the perks that yeah. they feel they have is to have you know is to have yeah. you know to be involved yeah. Yeah. sexually with women in the church but so here's my question so could can we see that, in this novel that Bambara is trying to posit, pro offer a kind of progressive black masculinity, and the fact that, again, that, that, that Miss Hazel rejects this mm -hmm. minister, but looks to Mr. Uh, Bovain, yeah. Bovain yeah, as, yeah. As, as, as an alternative, and the fact that it seems, although I'm not sure if she actually gives him the bath in the story, that, 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 that you know, he wants the bath and what have you. So again, is she positing a, a kind of alternative, a kind of progressive black uh, masculinity? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think to the extent that she does, it lies in Beauvais, right? You know, it lies in you know, the disabled subject and the, the very character who's who is uh, invalidated you know, by the ableism of um, black nationalism. I think you're absolutely right, in fact, about the black minister part. In fact, um, what Miss Hazel says is that the Reverend Trent, um, I forget who the wid what the widow man's name is, but the Reverend Trent tries to get the widow man to do something for the church almost immediately after his wife passes away. You know? and, um, and she says something like, you know, the widow man's wife wasn't cold in the ground before he went over you know, and tried to get the, to do whatever. You know, so it is a sort of critique of the... Um, you know, the sort of um, instrumentalist, you know, um, disregard of like, you know, of um, community, uh, the folks who are supposed to be the community caretakers, the official caretakers, you know. So in, in, I guess in many ways, you're making me think about the ways in which, um, in the same way that the short story critiques the presumption of the, the kids as the caretakers because they're the revolutionary nationalists. There's also a critique of the minister as the caretaker because he's a minister. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, thanks for that. Uh -huh. uh, I wonder if your talk in some sense uh, begs the question of the desirability of nationalist politics at all. And I was um, kind of thinking throughout of uh, recent critiques, uh, feminist critiques of liberal feminist United States complicity in United States nationalism and imperialism yeah. and yeah. so-called democracy promotion and yeah. the response uh, of some of the people articulating these critiques. And, and I'm thinking of a, a talk I heard a couple of years ago given mm -hmm. by uh, Judith Butler on this question mm -hmm. is to 
if not advocate an anti-nationalist feminism, then at least a feminism that explicitly disavows nationalist politics mm -hmm. you know, at all, mm -hmm. uh, and that is also at least anti-imperialist. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, you know, uh, I thought that, especially in terms of your citation of Hall citing uh, mm -hmm. Fanon with the nationalist mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. moment, but can never be enough, I mean, uh, is it, I mean, I guess, would you rather see more of what there can never be enough of, or should we be thinking of ways to not be nationalists, to be, you know, kind of coalitional and, and yeah, yeah. I mean, does the heifer, I mean, what is, does the heifer perhaps just not go with nationalism at all? Well, I mean, the thing is like, you know, it's her baby, so she can't like reject it, right? You know, so, um, and you know, the, the fire isn't nationalism, like the fire is minority difference in culture that could become nationalism if harnessed, right? <laughs> Um, so, you know, but to answer the question, I, yes. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, we need um, and we have, but we're not good about acknowledging the ways in which we have alternatives to nationalist politics. I mean, there's been an entire forgetting of black feminism, you know, and the ways in which it was consciously, deliberately, actively trying to do just that, trying to find, you know, some other model of political practice than nationalism. You know, like when, you know, Barbara Smith and um, in that interview in Homegirls where, you know, she says, so someone says, um, yesterday they had the uh, protest, this was like 1983, uh, at the UN against nuclear disarmament, we've got to figure out how that is a black feminist issue and how to construct that as a black feminist issue. So, you know, like um, that sort of active work um, in producing politics that are alternative to all the genres of nationalism must be an ongoing project, right? And um, this is, you know, you know, this is why I keep coming back to black feminism and to women of color feminism. Because um, that, that was the moment in which people were trying to do it. It wasn't, it didn't necessarily mean that they were succeeding at every point. I mean, there were failures all along the way and conflicts and everything. But as a um, desire, you know, as a goal, you know, you don't want to ever give that up, right? Um, you know, for instance, um, the whole stuff with uh, Robert Mugabe, right? Um, you know, that's a glaring example of, of um, when national liberation grinds to a halt. You know? And uh, we, need, we need new analytics, we need to revive old analytics for why that grinds to a halt. You know? um, yeah. yeah. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk, and I wanted to ask you about Alice Walker, because she was producing short stories at the same time mm -hmm. as Barbara, mm -hmm. and two of her stories came to mind. One mm -hmm. was Her Sweet Jerome. All right, and, and the Everyday other one, Use. Everyday Use, yes, exactly, right. exactly. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, one other quick question. Can you give me the title of the Stuart Hall piece that you were reading from? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's by Colin McCabe, M-C-C-A-B-E. Um, I think it's just Interview with Stuart Hall, but I can send you... I mean, if you give me your email address, I'll send you the, the um, article after that. But yeah, everyday use, right? I mean, you think, I mean, one of the reasons why I went to this short story is because you can't necessarily find this kind of stuff in a typical historical archive, right? One that documents the conflicts between, you know, um, you know the revolutionaries and the folks who the revolutionaries are supposed to be representing. Right? You know it through vernacular, my, my granddad is saying, still stay Roderick, you know, or you know, in the short story, or in everyday use. You know? like, that's a moment in which one has to go to the literary because the historical archive doesn't admit it. You know? You know, I mean, the historical archive, especially of that moment and after that moment, you know, is precisely the one that was created you know, out of the civil rights, the black power moment, right? So, it, you know, it would, you know, it would take an interesting subject of that moment to say, okay, here's some papers or here's evidence of how, you know, we got on the people's nerves, <laughs> you know? Okay, okay, sure. 
Well, let me just first join the chorus of folks thanking you for, for your presentation. You. It's actually very suggestive. You put a lot of stuff on my mind. I have less of a, of a, of a question, because in some ways I'm, di I'm still digesting uh -huh. uh, the presentation and the larger body of work that, that, it, that, is placed, uh -huh. that you place in. So part of what, what I mean, in terms of, of, of what's going on here is this, this issue of, of generation uh -huh. and how it plays itself out. And as I was listening to you, you talk, I was thinking about, for instance, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mm -hmm. which becomes a really good case mm -hmm. where you do have, not a harmony, but you do have this case where you have people talking yeah. and communicating yeah, exactly across right. these, gener these yeah. lines of generation. Yeah. And to the extent that they do that, the organization is actually quite successful. Yeah, exactly. So that becomes you know, one of the, yeah. but, then I, but I also have to put this on the table, yeah, and, sure. and maybe it's ill time, because this is the last yeah, question, sure. what yeah. have you. Yeah. But, I, but I do think that, that oftentimes, that when you talk about, when one talks about black nationalism or black power, that it oftentimes becomes this, this kind of cardboard cutout uh -huh. Right, uh -huh. in a sense, and so you know, I think about the work of Tracy Matthews, uh -huh. uh, Matt Countryman, uh, uh -huh. Stephen Ward, yeah, yeah. who talk in particular about how, if we think about Black feminism and Black power, then in fact uh, there was very much a close relationship. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. in fact, what you uh -huh. see with Black power and Black nationalism, you have these numerous kinds of trends. Yeah. Some that are yeah. clearly very reactionary, yeah, but yeah. then others that that are yeah. not. And no, some that are even multinational mm -hmm. and, and what have you. And mm -hmm. so what you have is, in a sense, uh, many different communities, mm -hmm. political communities, have a code, I apologize, no, no problem. Who, are, who are drawing symbols and signs mm -hmm. from black mm -hmm. power, black mm -hmm. nationalism, and mm -hmm. it becomes mm -hmm. not an umbrella, but it becomes this, this, this larger thing that people are pulling from, mm -hmm. that in fact it becomes, mm -hmm. in many cases, mm -hmm. a dialogue with, mm -hmm. within itself. Yeah. So that's not really a, a question, but it's a comment. Do with that what you want, respond or, okay. or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're, you're right. You know, you're right about that sort of historical observation, right? You know, for instance, um, you know, 70s black feminism, the folks that I'm talking about, Tony K. Bambara's, um, sorry, say again? I'm sorry, they come out of snake. Yeah, exactly right. But, you know, the larger observation is that they come out of the contradictions, right. you know, of black nationalism. That goes for black feminism, but it also goes for black queer formations, too, you know, of that moment. Um, you know, in many ways, that is also my genealogy. Um, you know, I started out, you know, as like, um, uh, you know, this black nationalist kid, you know, in Georgia, you know, and then observe the contradictions of black nationalism, especially, you know, as I had to contend with it, you know, and my own sort of burgeoning queer desires and stuff. And so, you know, I never want to suggest that those formations are not contradictory, you know, one. But I also, um, I also know that there are points that are irresolvable, you know, between them as well. <laughs> okay, and I'll leave it at that. 